I'd like to now invite our eminent panelists on the dais. Uh, may I start by calling on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention. We are now progressing to the first panel of uh, this second auto retail conclave. I'd request you to please take seats now. And let me invite on stage Sri Anuj Kathuria, Chief Operating Officer Ashok Leyland, to kindly grace the dais. Please welcome him on stage with a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, sir. I'd like to invite Mr. Harish Suri, FADA Chairperson, Uttarakhand. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Mr. Rajan Pentel, Senior Group President and Group Head, Branch and Retail Banking, Yes Bank. Mr. Pentel, warm welcome, sir. Mr. Rajat Mahajan, Partner, Deloitte Consulting, India. Mr. Rajiv Chaba, President and MD, MG Motor India. May I request you to kindly join us on stage, sir. Mr. Yadvinder Singh Guleria, SVP Sales and Marketing, HMSI. There he is. And I'd like to invite Mr. Rama Rao, former EVP Sales, Marketing and Aftermarkets, HD Trucks, VCV. He's our moderator. Now, very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, let me take the privilege of introducing you to our eminent panel. I'd like to advise all those of you closer to the exit to either join us back on seats or exit the room, please, so that we can continue to focus on our first set of deliberations through this panel. Please settle in. Please settle in. Thank you very much. Let me now take the privilege of introducing our panel. We have on the panel Sri Anuj Kathuria, who is Chief Operating Officer Ashok Leyland. He has recently been elevated to the position of COO of Ashok Leyland. In this position, he's responsible for the global M and HCV business, sourcing, manufacturing, and network. He's an alumni of BITS, XLRI, Jamshedpur, and Harvard Business School. He has an illustrious career spanning 29 years, uh, studied with diverse experience in automotive industry, covering sales and marketing, manufacturing, sourcing, mergers and acquisitions, and program management. He was head global sourcing for Tata Davu, Korea, and went on to head Tata Motors World Truck Factory. Once again, a very warm welcome to you, sir. I'd like to now take the privilege of introducing Sri Harish Suri, MD, Dehradun Premier Motors Limited, Managing Director of DDPM Group, which is one of the largest automobiles dealership groups in North India, representing M&M, Hyundai, VW, Bharat Benz, Bosch, Mobis, and other manufacturers in 20 locations across Uttarakhand and Western UP. He holds the degree of B in Civil Engineering and an MBA in Marketing, and prior to returning to India over 10 years ago, for personal reasons, he was a banker for 20 years with Citibank. His positions included Head of Citibank India, Regional Director based out of Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand, and finally as Managing Director, Asia Pacific, based in Tokyo, covering the 37 countries in the region. Warm welcome once again, sir. I'd like to now uh, introduce uh, to you Sri Rajan Penton, who is the Senior Group President and Group Head, Branch and Retail Banking, Yes Bank. The Senior Group President and Group Head of Branch and Retail Banking has three decades of experience in the financial services industry. His portfolio at Yes Bank includes branch banking, retail liabilities, retail assets, and micro-enterprises banking, enabling retail banking to become a force multiplier and improving the profitability through new acquisitions, granular, CASA, Yes First, and Yes Premier, sales alternate channel, and cross-sell to existing customers, leveraging on their, uh, on, uh, their existing retail franchise. Uh, warm welcome to you, Mr. Rajan Pentel. I'm going to now introduce Mr. Rajat Mahajan, who is a partner with Deloitte Consulting India with 17 and more years of experience, which is a mix of consulting and industry. He started his career with his family business. His consulting experience is largely within auto, retail, and consumer. And he's worked with clients across India, Middle East, and Europe. He's led multiple large-scale transformation programs with a focus on revenue enhancement, profitability improvements, dealer operations, customer service, and sales operations. Warm welcome, sir. I'd like to now take the privilege of introducing Sri Rajiv Chaba, President and MD, MG Motor India. Uh, and uh, MG Motor India is the India unit of the iconic Morris uh, Garages brand. As one of the most renowned automotive experts with over four decades of industry experience, Sri Rajiv Chaba has been instrumental in driving the MG brand in the country. In his role at MG Motor India, Sri Chaba has nurtured a strong organization-wide focus on technology as a key differentiator. And under his leadership, the Marquee brand has successfully introduced the Hector, its first India-centric product and the country's first internet car in the market. Warm welcome to you once again, sir. 
Now let me take the privilege, ladies and gentlemen, of introducing to you Sri Yadvinder Singh Guleria, the Senior Vice President, Sales and Marketing, Honda Motorcycle and Scooter India. Uh, he's currently at the helm of navigating the sales and marketing operations. With his intuitive understanding of market dynamics, Sri Guleria has mined opportunities in uncertain times and led Honda to become the second largest two-wheeler company in India by far. Ashri Guleria spearheads a young team that has since innovated and redefined the realms of possibilities in the Indian two-wheeler industry. Mr. Guleria oversaw the creation of differentiated brand journey of Honda wing mark identity in the two-wheeler industry and his suave marketer instinct has led Honda Motorcycle and Scooter India to numerous accolades for the brand as well as the products. Warm welcome, sir. And our moderator, ladies and gentlemen, Sri Rama Rao, former EVP Sales, Marketing and Aftermarket, HD Trucks, VECV, uh, has done his bachelor's in engineering and has the he comes armed with the work experience of over 30 years in automobile and construction equipment industry in the fields of sales and marketing. Let's welcome our moderator and our eminent panelists with a huge round of applause once again, ladies and gentlemen, with a big hand. Warm welcome. And may I now uh, hand over the stage to Sri Rama Rao, sir, please. Thank you. Um, very happy to be sitting here, uh, being part of this panel discussion uh, for one reason, which is uh, dealer profitability. This is something which has been uh, very close to my heart because, uh, as an industry, as an industry, uh, we have been talking about creating the right customer experience. Uh, for several decades now. However, when it comes to uh, customer experience, uh, in terms of technology, there has been great progress that we have made in India. However, when it comes to delivering that customer experience, uh, it's all happening at the dealership. And together as an industry, while we have invested heavily in terms of creating good infrastructure, we are still miles away in terms of creating that right experience for our customers. And when we have this dialogue going on between the OEMs and dealers, there's one thing which has always, you know, uh, been a point of, you know, discussion, uh, point of disagreement in terms of, you know, how much more we need to invest. Okay, so when we actually speak to uh, several dealers, we understand that you know the dealer profitability is something which is stopping most of our dealers, especially the new gen dealers, in making more investments in creating the right customer experience. And the profitability, I mean, is varying you know, so dramatically from one brand to another brand, one geography to another geography, from the size of dealership to a small to big. You know, you hear dealers talking about you know uh, some. Exceptions. I'm talking here. Uh, dealer profitability, you know, operating income margin or profit before tax, whatever you may call it, anywhere between four to five percent. But this is a small exception. But if you talk about the larger fraternity, we are in the range of half a percent to say about two percent. This is something which I believe should be a concern, not just for dealers but for the whole industry, because without the right profitability. I believe it will be impossible for us to actually build this business. So, this is something which I have been actually working uh, with different brands myself in the last 30 years. And uh, so, I am happy to be part of this panel discussion today and looking forward uh, you know, to some sort of you know, direction setting uh, in terms of what should be the long term, let's say, uh, you know, things that we should do as an industry, not as OEMs and dealers, but together as a fraternity, what is it we need to do? And similarly, from a short to medium term point of view, what is that we need to do? Short to medium term, of course, we are not talking about the crisis that we are going through right now. It is well beyond that. Because, you know, we cannot go from a level of half a percent to five percent overnight. So we need to see really and what is that we need to do from OEMs and also what are the various other opportunities that we need to look at as an industry, as dealers, uh, in terms of taking it from, you know, so low level, you know, which is less than one percent to uh, maybe in the uh, short to medium term to let's say 3 to 3 and percent and there and then from there let's go to 5% over a period of let's say 3 to 5 years time whatever it is. So with that I would like to actually you now uh, open that dialogue and I would request Mr. Rajan from S-Bank 
to make uh, you know comments in terms of you know when you are looking at uh, dealer fraternity, when you are actually funding dealers, what is the minimum level of expectation you know that you would like to see you know in terms of profitability from our distribution network? So uh, it's a very relevant uh, uh, topic. Uh, the context in which we are talking, the phase in which we are talking. Uh, I think uh, the way traditionally the banks have looked at uh, the dealership business uh, has definitely undergone a change. Uh, this business has been largely relationship driven. Uh, banks have been looking at the ratios but not the way they would look at in MSME segment or the related industry. So there have been, uh, you know, uh, I would say some kind of an flexibility which has been available and, and hence uh, the industry has an exposure of, the banks have an exposure of close to 70-80,000 crores on the dealership business. So every up and down in the industry actually uh, leaves a mark and is also a good learning, uh, is also uh, a time to uh, take a stock of what is happening and how it should be conducted. So uh, when the highs were there, we saw a lot of expansion. Uh, we saw uh, people opening outlets, upgrades and whatnot. Uh, at that point of time, I think the, the only focus was that since there is a growth and to capture that growth, you should be present, uh, you should be omnipresent, you should be present at more and more points. But when the industry has come down and suddenly uh, this data what you have written 200, 250, I would actually put it uh, close to 400, right? The number is actually much higher, wherein you have seen the dealers uh, going belly up. Uh, I think uh, the banks uh, ought to be more cautious. The bank needs, the banks need to be really looking at the complete business model, uh, the, uh, you know, the investment of the, the principal um, and what is his churn. So these are, I think, three very, very important aspects which need to be taken care of. And one very important point is what kind of investments he is making and will those investments actually return into the kind of yield which he is looking at. So, uh, so these are some of the important aspects which were, which were possibly, they were looked at, but they were looked at with little bit of flexibility. Uh, but now in the interest of the business, in the interest of the dealer, in the interest of the OEM, I think all the three will have to work very closely while looking at a proposal. So I think we are moving away from a situation wherein uh, actually the inventory funding started in India with the manufacturer giving a comfort letter and then somewhere it went off. I think the time has come when all the three parties have to start vetting the proposal before it goes through. So these are I think some of the very, very important changes, you know, which have, which have happened and which the industry is going through. Uh, we always have to keep it in mind is that when a dealer goes belly up, the amount ranging from 10 to 100 crores, a bank can lose in one go. So this is, this is something which, which really needs to be looked at under a lens and, and looked at very, very closely. Okay. When we look at the business model, um, and if you look back last few decades, the fo focus was in terms of creating the network. But from there, I think the whole industry, the business model is moving towards operating and profit money. So from that point of view, I would like to ask, uh, you know, uh, once again, uh, uh, Mr. Rajan, what is the operating income margin that you would be happy to, you know, going forward in terms of you know, funding dealers? Because so, that, I believe, is the base so that, you know, accordingly, the OEMs then, of course, can look at, you know, what are the margins that they could look at in terms of, you know, whether it is new vehicle sales, or the spare part sales, or what should be the inventory and all of that? So I think at a composite level, anything uh, ranging from 4 to 6% is, is, is a decent margin what we should be looking at. And obviously you can break it up into, into various components, whether it is new sales, service, spares, you know, the, the whole operation and the other incomes involved. So anything close to that would be a feasible business proposition. Great. I think now we have a base in terms of you know, what actually uh, satisfies the people who are going to fund us you know, as dealer fraternity. So with that background, I would like to understand, uh, you know, uh, uh, from Mr. Rajiv, uh, you know, uh, you being now uh, you know, the new baby you know, in the industry and rightfully creating all the right ripples in terms of you know, using technology uh, you know, uh, to create the key initiation. 
and we also uh, understand from our deal of fraternity that you know you are trying to disturb rightfully uh, the margins on the new uh, vehicle sales. What made you to actually look at you know uh, the margins that we have heard you know uh, if it is right you know anywhere between uh, you know six to nine percent. Uh, so what made you to actually look at you know that sort of margin when the whole industry seems to be working at a different level? So I hope I can keep it shorter. The problem with me is that I love my voice and when I start talking, I keep talking. So just, just tell me to shut up at some point of time. Anyway, uh, see the thing is, uh, one thing, uh, it was very clear to us right from the start that in this market when uh, we have giants like Maruti and Bandai and they, are, they control 70% of the market share uh, and the other players, two, three other players put together go up to 80-90%. And some of the Western players uh, probably are not on the top of the mind and they may be doing well in their own business as per their own business goals in India, but from consumer perspective, they are not on the top of the mind. So why should we be successful in this market when we are launching? And, uh, and also then UK brand name MG, you know, you, we may say it's 100 year old, but how many guys in India knew MG? And then you have a Chinese parent and then in India we have that image that if something is coming from China has its own connotations. So why would you buy any MG product in this country? So one thing was very clear to us that we need to be disruptive. We need to do things in a very different way. And, and it started with the very fact that the kind of culture we want, what we want to have, the kind of innovation we want to have, it was clear that technology is going to be a big parameter, a uh, big, big founding uh, pillar. Then we need to have the right people, right dealers, right suppliers. And if we have the right people, they can take care of the dealers. And obviously suppliers are with us, and then we can take care of the customer. So how do you get right dealers? And then starts the basic concept, which in the industry we have been talking about, uh, but I think simple talking, I think we are trying to walk the talk. So very simple thing that we said, we will never in this company talk about wholesales. It's all only retail. The numbers which we have started giving, <laughs> the numbers which we have started giving to Siam is all retail. They count it as wholesale because that's not the concept in our country, right? But we are we are doing retail. Trust me, in our company, uh, maybe the sales head knows wholesale, but even regional manager and area manager do not know uh, what wholesales we have done so far. We don't tell them. Because we said that's not your that's not your prerogative. It's retail. Second, we said dealers forget profitability. In today's time, let's talk about dealer viability to start with. And then profitability. So when we're talking about viability, our simple mantra is that you take care of customer satisfaction, we take care of your profitability, period. Because the whole thing because the whole thing is that if suppose I have hundred crore marketing spend, as an example. And if I have to, if suppose there is something going wrong with a particular dealer and I have to distribute 5 or 10 crores out of that 100 crores, that makes market sense and business sense to allocate that, that 10 crores to take care of dealer viability. Otherwise, dealer, whether you right or wrong, you are forcing dealer to charge money from the customer and the customer is going to be unhappy and whatever advertising you may do is going to be wasted. So I think certain fundamentals have to be in place. The third thing we said very clearly that one market, one dealer in general so that we don't create unnecessary competition. And we are, and we are again, simple, simply we are saying that when you can have a business model of one exclusive supplier for a particular component, so you are 100% dependent on a supplier for one particular component, can't you be dependent on a dealer for a particular territory? You know, so again the thing is that you have to find the right partner and by the way in this process we may make mistakes and by the way in MG actor we have made mistakes. In two or three places, we didn't find the right partner. We selected, but but then you change you change the partner there. But in general, and fi frankly, here we have learned something from Toyota because we are learning from all the best practices that have less number of dealers and grow with them. So this is what we are trying to do. So these are some simple basics which I think we are trying to follow. And then in terms of margin, frankly, margin is how do you want to see it? People give incentive, wholesale incentive, monthly incentive, quarterly. Incentive. Put together, probably also it comes together. So I think our structure is something which dealers can appreciate, and that's what we're doing. Thanks.
in our industry, uh, we need tons of uh, real estate, lots of land. So my question uh, is to Mr. Anoz. <clears throat> Whether uh, you service a car, or a motorcycle, or a commercial vehicle, uh, you need land, you need building, and the rentals that we pay is the same. You know, whether uh, you know you cater to a two-wheeler customer, four-wheeler customer, a commercial vehicle customer. So from that background, uh, when we look at uh, the CV space specifically, commercial vehicle space, uh, the challenges for the uh, dealer network seems to be uh, manifold compared to a two-wheeler or four-wheeler, uh, let's say, dealers. So with this background, how do you see? You know, uh, what should be the right let's say, uh, the level of margins when it comes to uh, the commercial rates, both in terms of uh, uh, trucks and parts, so that we can actually flow, go over a period of time closer to the bank's expectation in terms of, uh, you know, operating income margins. Because, you know, if we are today half a percent to two percent operating income margin level, uh, any day, any of the, I mean, any dealer can actually go belly up. Uh, that's something which is not something which uh, anybody loves. So from that point of view, over a period of time, you know, if you look at you know, uh, most of the OEMs, uh, they have been consistently delivering uh, very healthy uh, you know, operating income margins uh, uh, within the CV space. So uh, from a CV industry point of view, how do you look at you know, the margin should evolve uh, for the dealers, both in terms of uh, uh, new vehicle sales as well as spare part sales? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, FADA uh, to invite me as a panelist over here. Uh, the topic that has been selected, the first panel, it's quite relevant. And generally what happens is that in this kind of a, a phase where the industry is going through a possible downturn, uh, we start talking about profitability and the consequences. And you know, as Mr. Rajan was saying, many dealers are folding up or going belly up. But actually, if you see, uh, we need to focus on this aspect at all times. And at Ashok Leland, and since I am the only one from the CV industry on this panel, I would say that at Ashok Leland, not now, but at least if I go 10 years back, we had coined a brand promise of Aapki Jeet, Hamari Jeet. When I say Aapki Jeet, Hamari Jeet, it doesn't stand only for the customers, but it equally applies to our channel partners. And we always uh, kind of not only worry, but also uh, take a sharper look and a sh get a sharper understanding of our dealer and the channel profitability. This is one of the things that is on our minds at all points in time. Having said that, and as uh, Ramarao said about the uh, CV industry, I would also like to take this opportunity to say that you know the dealerships, when they set up their dealerships, uh, while automobile is a bigger space, but when we talk about pass car versus uh, commercial vehicles, the requirements of the customers are different, the way the sales happens is different, so we need to be more sensitive to how we set up our dealerships. Because naturally the revenue streams that can come from a commercial vehicle uh, in sales or even after the sales has happened in the aftermarket support can be very, very different. So we encourage all our dealerships to, when they are actually starting the investment process, to see how we can be smart enough to be very careful and very mindful of what are we investing into. And Mr. Ramarao, to your question about the real estate, uh, we do not want our uh, dealers, uh, friends to have large setups which are unwieldy because we know that we are in a cyclical industry. Every three to four years there will be a down cycle that will stare at us. So we need to be smart to understand this. In my last 30 years in the industry, this is the probably the eighth down cycle that I will be seeing for myself. So when this kind of a down cycle happens, uh, people start worrying about you know their costs. But you have to be mindful at all points in time. So we encourage our dealers to be very sp uh, smart in their investments. Also what we have done is that we have recently, more recently we have said that rather than every time the vehicle or the customer having to come to the workshop, how can we have a smarter solution 
where the workshops, the mobile workshops start going to the uh, customers. That actually helps in more than one ways. The customer is happier, he is getting service at his doorstep. Secondly, the investment in the real estate is also kind of, you know, to that extent at least minimized. So, if you see the business model that we all operate in, today our customers are uh, uh, smarter to understand w what they should pay for, what is acquisition cost on one side. So the uh, customers are going to, uh, in this kind of a situation where there is a kind of excess capacity, they are going to naturally negotiate for the best prices. But what we work along with our dealers is that rather than looking at each other's pocket between the OEM and the dealer fraternity, let us try to see what is the wastage that is there in the system. Because we find that there's a lot of waste that happens all across. I would like to mention a few. You know, uh, Mr. Uh, Rajan Vadera in his address also was telling that how can we have a, a better systematic forecasting methodologies in the, in the industry. Today there is a lot of vehicles that get produced based on certain forecasts, certain predictions. But then uh, we find them uh, standing at various uh, sales yards or at the dealer stock yards, which is again creating a waste which does not help anybody uh, in the industry. There are several other uh, ways in which we can work smarter. We can actually eliminate uh, waste from the system. We can also then start looking at, uh, we had done a study some time back at Ashok Leland, which I would like to share with all of you. It's a very interesting study. If I take uh, the product life cycle of a commercial vehicle, say an 8 by 2 truck, in the f 6 years of operations, the customer spends close to 3 crores of rupees in uh, acquiring the vehicle, in running the vehicle, in maintaining the vehicle till, it's, uh, till the end of the life cycle. Out of the 3 crores, the acquisition cost is less than 10%. The remaining 90% is in the operations. So this is where most of the OEMs, most of the dealer fraternity, they are not going to, uh, they, don't, they don't get involved to that extent. Our engagement with the customers in that 90% is limited. So how can we actually uh, look at different revenue streams, especially in the commercial vehicle? We have made a few initiatives. Uh, one thing uh, which I would like to make a special mention of is that we have uh, recently tied up with HPCL and we have now started giving uh, fuel cards, NN cards with all our vehicle sales. This actually is not only helping the OEM and the oil, ma oil marketing company, but also it helps our dealerships to get that extra revenue from them. So we would like to partner with our dealers in uh, various other revenue streams. We, many of our dealers also partner with us today to convert our vehicles into fully built solutions. And that helps our customers immensely. They get ready to use vehicles from day one. So we encourage uh, the dealers to come forward to partner with us. One of the other things which we are going to also attempt, and this is something which is not going to be easy, people talk about uh, reporting wholesale figures versus retail figures. This is something which can be done more simply. But think of a situation where we do not have to have these two figures very differently, whether it's a wholesale. So in, in today's context, because of the way the products are designed, we have to build vehicles to stock because naturally the customer is not ready to wait for the vehicle once he, uh, the need, his need is established. So what we are trying to attempt in BS6 is that we will have a modular platform. Through this modular platform, it's not only in the design, but this is how we will run the business. What we are going to do is, we are going to take orders, or what we call as made-to-order system, so that the customer, from the time he places the order, we could attempt to deliver the vehicle within two weeks. In this way, what it does is that the stock, whether it is lying at the dealer's end or our, at our end, gets minimized. Yes, I am saying that 100% of the sales cannot happen on the MTO process, but there is a very good chance
to attempt this with a modular design. And as we go forward, we'll try to see how we can uh, completely 100% of the sales come on this platform. So I just mentioned a few of the initiatives which will help uh, dealers to invest smartly, uh, rotate their uh, finances uh, better, have more cycles of rotation, and also do not unnecessarily keep on paying interest on things which are not going to uh, get them any returns. Plus, uh, we also encourage the dealers not to only depend on sales revenues or sales margins. Also, we have a concept of service absorption ratio where we say that the dealer should be breaking even from the revenues that they earn from the service and parts so that in a down cycle like this, they do not go belly up, they are protected. And in an up cycle, uh, they can make good money. So these are some of the thoughts I thought I'll share with you. Uh, very good afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, in lighter vein, I would like to say we are in the, first, in the month of September and every time FADA organizes in September, SAM conference in September. So what happens in September is that we are almost at the doorstep of the festival season which is coming. So we come with the hope that Goddess Lakshmi is there to open this door and all will have good, good things. If uh, industry anyhow is in positive, everyone in this hall would have been positive. And now since we are on the verge of the festival, Still, we are positive because, as we say in Hindi, Chai Aasha Jitni Bhi Jhoti Ho, Nirasha Se To Better Hai. <coughs> so, uh, I must compliment that we are in September. First half year is not still closed. So, we do not know what is going to be the growth plus minus. <coughs> but yes, uh, there is a hope. There are certain positive things being, you know, talked about and then uh, everybody is hoping of that 5% PBT. I don't know who decided 5 or f not 4 or 6. So there must be some background uh, I would like to discuss with FADA president separately that it has to be only 5% or, or what. Because the way Mr. Rajiv got the claps, I'm sure you have to give a advertisement now, no more application will be received for MGM dealerships. <laughs> Especially on the right hand side. I don't know about left hand side, whether they are two-wheeler dealer or four-wheeler dealer, but most of the people on the right hand side, maximum clapping. So please spend more time there and you may get some good diamond and platinum dealers out there who probably would be the prospect. So coming back again on, uh, okay, why a brand need to invest and, uh, you know, revive on the brand identity or CIP programs, which we have to say. Uh, first, I, I do not agree that there is a high frequency. There may be a perception in the market that we keep on changing. What, but what exactly happens, there are certain disruptions or the best way to call disruption is creative turbulence in the market. There are new entrants, there are new brands who walk into the market and they are giving a totally different experience to the customers. Irrespective of the industry, the benchmarks are created in the mind of the consumer by what they experience as a customer. Whether they have gone to auto dealership or a consumer dealer dealership or they have bought, bought any other thing. Once they that experience that, the expectation of their dealing, once they walk into any other two-wheeler dealership or a four-wheeler dealership, that is the benchmark which starts building up in their mind. So now, as a brand custodians, we need to keep on evaluating where do my stand, my brand stands in the consumer minds in terms of the perception? Because one is intention, the second is perception. 
both are important. I think most of the people in the hall will say that intention is more important, but it cannot be at the cost of perception. So now, if we have to relook into that branding, we need to be very clear from, the, from our marketing point of view, from maybe the, whether it is a third party agency, that where your brand stands in the minds of the consumer, in terms of the overall image. You may not have a product today, but there is a strong perception of the brand, so I think you are safe. But if the brand perception is also going down in the mind of the consumer, even you may have the best of the product, your experience which is finally delivered to the customer may be down. So that's the time when we need to start re-looking at our whole program. CIP may be sometime only inside the environment. It may not be talking about the external or exterior board. It could be only the uniform of your staff. It could be some other training aspect which may allow or it may require some kind of interference where you need to reskill your people along with some visible parameters which will touch the heart of the consumer. So from brand to brand, the level of this uh, interference may differ. Some brand may require a total turnaround, right from you, how you are seen from the outside, then you walk in, and then how you are talking to you, the salespeople and see the product. So that means the product portfolio has to be changed, CIP has to be changed, staff has to be changed, everything is being changed. But in other brand point of view, it may be only the product or some few features which need to be added because that is where the perception has gone down. So it has to be a very fair mix of, uh, you know, your new CIP program. And that's how my take is that it's not a total turnaround. Every brand must evaluate what aspect they need to touch and change so that you remain relevant to the tunes or, or the relevant to the times in which you are operating and the brand longevity is sustained over a period of time. Five person is coming, of course, you can have a private discussion with the president. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, the whole uh, idea is about, you know, how to create the right, uh, you know, customer experience. And for any entrepreneur, uh, if they have to invest uh, from a long-term point of view, uh, if sufficient profits are not made, and this profitability we are talking about, 5% is coming from the FADA association with other associations like NADA, or with the Australian institution, so that over a period of time, you know, when we are hitting, you know, in this cyclical business lows, you know, you still have some cash to ensure that, you know, you're not, you know, belly up. So from that point of view, I think, you know, you cannot work at wafer thin margins. So it is critical, but at the same time, uh, we are not saying, you know, we need to move uh, to 5% level in a year's time, but there should be clarity in terms of by when, you know, the industry should move to, you know, close to 5% operating income margin level. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I, I do understand it was just in a joke, uh, it was a joke, but I would like to compliment here Mr. Rajan that you have already loaded down there starting from 4%. <laughs> you know, you did not say my benchmark is 5%. The way the bankers are looking at because there's a lot of investment and capital which all the dealers require to run this business. But at the same time, this 5% I think could be a thumb rule. But in my understanding, see business is all about creating, managing and expanding wealth. So, if there is a dealer who is entering and it's the first time they are investing money, for example, in the case of MGM, so if I start talking on day one on 5%, I think whether it is going to lead them to really make, uh, start making investment or not. So, it's a long-term investment for sure, but every dealer must evaluate they are in which stage. They are in creation of wealth stage. They are in man only managing the wealth state that I am already at 50% market share. My challenge is how do I maintain my market share and for that what kind of investment I need to look at or someone who has already reached 20, 30 and there is big chance for them to become number one because 20 and 30% market share does not mean that you are clear number one. Crossing around 30% market share, there are chances of becoming number one in the market or whichever segment you are playing in. So if in case it is expansion, then there is a different sort of investment which is required. So please see, you are in which stage? Creation of wealth, management of wealth, maybe the business has been handed over to you by your father or uncle or your mother or grandparents. And the big responsibility first is how well you are able to manage this business. 
and then using your creative intuition to expand the wealth and the name of the family. So it requires, you know, different stage of involvement in my understanding. Let us hear from Harishji what is his reflection about your comments because, you know, what part of the space he is in and uh, what are your expectations, Harishji? Thank you. Uh, my, my way of looking at it is that uh, you can't look at 5% PPT in isolation. Uh, before becoming a dealer, I spent more time as a banker. So I think it's more important for us to look at what is return on capital employed rather than looking at PBT as a number. And if you look at the dealership, it is a very, very capital intensive business. And if it is capital intensive, then obviously your returns need to be higher to take care of cyclicality. And uh, if, if uh, the commercial vehicle business is more cyclical than others, then dealers need to be compensated more for that cyclicality than a steady state business that may be a two-wheeler business. Right. So I think it's a concept of where you are in the industry and what you're looking at. Uh, I can only share with you my experience over 10 years and I've sort of met with every manufacturer. Not a single manufacturer has ever shown a business model which includes the cost of land. Because you cannot develop a business model which shows that you can make a return on investment if you take the cost of land. But in today's uh, scenario, land is, is a cost. It is not wealth creation that you bought land and it's going to double in five years and you know grow 10 times in the next 10 or 20 years. So I think one of the other panelists also alluded to the fact that a lot of dealers who are on a rental business have gone out of business. And the reason they've gone out of business is because you've not intuitively imputed a cost of capital to the land that you own. And I think the time has come that we need to look at it carefully and say, what is it that we need to earn as a business for it to be sustainable going down the road? Because it is also in the manufacturer's interest to get good, high-quality dealers. You can always get somebody with money. You know, that's not a problem in India. You can always get somebody from the real estate business or from a political background where they have loads of money and they can put it into a dealership. But the question is, can they run a dealership? Do they have satisfied customers? And can they build a long, sustainable business? So I think that needs to, uh, to be looked at. The other aspect, the final aspect that I look at is that is this a business that is attracting the next gen? And if it cannot attract the next gen, then I'm afraid the prospects for this business are very, very bleak. And as I look at this room, I don't see too many young people around. I don't know how many of my children, I, I talk to a lot of dealers, and our biggest concern is that none of our children ever want to join our business. Now, these are big businesses, they're profitable businesses, people know them in the market. So there must be something that does not excite them to come and work in this business. And this is something that not only dealerships need to ponder on, but manufacturers themselves that, look, if you're going to survive and thrive, and I think every manufacturer has seen that whenever a high-performing next-gen has joined the business, the business has gone to a different level. And if there has been no change and no uh, human talent that comes into a business, it, it, it suffers. So I, I would urge everybody to look at it not just as a PBT number, but look at what does it take for this business to be sustainable in the long term. I think uh, you brought very interesting point. Gen Next doesn't want to actually, I mean, in general, I'm saying, doesn't want to continue the you know business. Uh, so, what are the challenges they are facing? You know, uh, you know why Gen Next doesn't want to take this? You know, are there any specific reasons uh, this industry you know uh, is putting you know in front of them? Uh, you know, my understanding. Uh, I have a couple of kids who are working, but don't want to come and join my business. So 
I asked them, I said, uh, why would you not want to do that? I think uh, primarily their aspirations are very different from, from our generation. Uh, they want to be involved with newer age businesses. Uh, they're not willing to put up the, uh, with, uh, with the aggravation of working 12 hours a day. Uh, they don't want to have uh, aggravation of uh, the thought process and disagreements with the manufacturer, with the customer, with the regulators, with the hundreds of government agencies that come to your office every day. So I think, you know, you have to make it more interesting for them to say that you want to take this business to the digital age. Maybe that may excite them. But the fact that you come to a dealership and sell a vehicle or service a vehicle is of no interest to them. No, I also asked this question because uh, if Jen next is not going to take over, then of course it is time to bring in more and more professionals into the business, which again is going to go, you know, increase the expenses at the dealerships and rightfully, uh, and then of course uh, over a period of time that should help in terms of creating the right customer experience, uh, you know, at the point of sales. So all the more reasons to see that you know we are making enough, uh, we are left with more money at the dealerships. So now I actually, uh, if you have to move in this direction of, you know, either 5% uh, PVT or in terms of, you know, uh, what return I'm making on my investment, uh, what are the milestones, uh, you know, we should, uh, you know, have? And uh, here I would actually, you know, uh, request Mr. Rajat to actually make some reflections. And also in terms of what are the various revenue channels that one can look at, which are sort of non-traditional in nature, uh, you know, to, uh, to increase uh, you know, the uh, profitability of the dealership without really increasing the investments, you know, that are going into the distribution network. Thank you. So I think uh, uh, this topic is a very close topic to all of us, right? Two things I'd like to say. The two questions that I heard from you, one is, you know, new revenue streams, revenue channels, and how do we achieve this 5% PBT goal? In my way, you know, in my understanding, the way it's two things are required to run a business. You know, one is intent and second is content. If I have to just comment on the content part, there are, you know, if we have to say that today I'm at, let's say, 2%, I need to take steps to reach 5%. I'm just 5%, maybe it could be 6% as well, right? But I'm not uh, debating it. But those steps could be, you know, number one is KYC, which is know your cost, right? I'm just, you know, uh, turning this whole thing upside down because if we talk about customers a lot, that's extremely important, but you know, you know, it's important for businesses like this to know their costs extremely well. You know, where is the pain going? Where is the money being spent on electricity, on, for example, at one of the places we learned from a good dealer that, you know, they, people are actually observing the total horsepower required for their facility. And then accordingly, deploying the number of compressors required, right? That was a huge impact because the point is that anywhere from, from 10 to 14 percent of your total turnover is this cost base. And anything like 10 percent focus will give you one to one and a half percent. That's like the first stepping stone, okay? The second one could be your financing cost, right? Which is the big one which also, you know, everybody spoke about. Uh, it, it comes in real estate, investments, plus also a lot of demo cards, courtesy cards, etc. So somewhere over there, you know, you need to think of and here the OEMs and the dealers will need to play or rather create a viable or, you know, we can call it a minimum viable ecosystem, right, where all the different parties participate and contribute ideas, whether in terms of uh, optimized dealerships, small dealerships can be built something which doesn't impact the customer experience that the OEM wants to provide. And here the OEM and the dealer has to be, has to work hand in hand to come out with those concepts. Right? Uh, including even demo car, right? Can you figure out any with the help of bankers and various other people in the market, private equities, etc., create an ecosystem to because if the market is going to grow to fold, etc., right? I mean, and Mr. Chava said that you're not going to increase the number of dealers many fold, then the pressure of demo cars and further investments will be high. So who, is there anybody else who can make it as a viable independent business model per se? So this is another stepping stone to that 5%. And the third is our traditional KYC, which is know your customer, which doesn't go anywhere, it's in the heart. And <coughs> I think uh, 
No, and I completely agree with your views where people need to be aware that, you know, customer is looking at things differently, right? We all are aware nearly, we conducted a survey some time back which said 47% of the customers use cars for daily commute, which means 53% are not using those cars for daily commute, right? It, things are changing, shared mobility is coming in, and even the customers who are buying cars, right, they are expecting different the lead conversion timeline from the time you've identified uh, for a customer that I have a need of buying a car till the time the customer lands up to take a test drive, that period is elongating. So it's important for us to engage with the customer. Once the engagement has started, one interesting thing which another, you know, we were doing another survey and we found out that, uh, I hope I have time, one more minute, sorry. So uh, another customer that we figured out was People in the metro cities, everybody must have heard that, you know, people are okay to take test drives at their convenience. But interestingly, if you go to tier 3 towns, or tier 2 towns, which are actually growing right now, people don't want test drives at home. That's what we figured out. So how do you deal with it? And some even we deal, when we worked with an OEM and the dealer, we realized a lot of these, uh, the salesmen were pushing these leads behind. And the real reason was the customers don't want their neighbors to know that they're buying a car or evaluating a car. So I think be intimate, know your customers well. On the service side also, we're spending a whole host of money in building state-of-the-art, you know, workshops, which is customer-friendly, et cetera. You know, maybe we need to think a little differently. One of the surveys that we conducted said, customers, the paramount thing for the customer in service is the relationship with the service advisor. You know, how well the service advisor know you. Okay. Do you trust that guy? Every six months somebody is changing, etc. They don't mind sending the car away 20, 30 kilometers for service. They want the service advisor to be present when they want their query to be answered. So these are small things, knowing your customer better will definitely give you the third Philip on the <coughs> Next. And uh, intent part, I mean, hand on heart, all of us as dealer community, how much time do we spend in grilling our employees? Or, I mean, it's, uh, my request would be don't grill, you know, just upskill them. Somewhere, the questions that we are facing now, we even we don't know the answers. So I think people are, uh, you know, leasing has come into the market. People, customers come and ask about these things. The sales people don't know how to respond properly. So just don't grill people, right? Employees, I think somebody said early on that uh, take care of employees, right? So don't grill, just upskill them. That's extremely important. And finally, how much time as we as dealer community, when we get up in the morning, right? What kind of review mechanism, just going back to the very basics, right? Do we spend enough time, and this is an important part of intent, in asking the right questions? So if it means that I need to upskill myself, right, so be it, so that I can actually then ask the right questions, and the whole world is about asking the right questions. And the last point, uh, the question that you asked, you know, in future, you know, we all know about, uh, I won't talk much about the future of mobility, we've been hearing about it, I think the new and new profit pools will emerge in future. So as a dealer community, we will need to see how to tap onto one or many profit pools with the OEMs and uh, the associated ecosystem. And these profit pools could be in the area of mobility, in the area of smart city, uh, charging infrastructure, multiple. So just, you know, uh, just to summarize my long statement is, you know, there are three stepping stones, right? But important thing for us to get those stepping stones is to get our intent right and be future ready. Rather than, you know, once future hits you and then you start reacting to it, create some sort of a mechanism so that you are able to develop competencies right. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, there's also a lot of uh, discussion around uh, people. Uh, in fact, Mr. Rajan Vadera, Sam President, also spoke about people and uh, how we should actually look at 
you know, whenever a dealership starts, you know, it should look at how it can be managed, not only for now, but also for the coming next two, two to three, two, three generations. So from that point of view, I think upscaling is another key important point. Uh, so my question is, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Rajiv, uh, you have brought a lot of uh, technology in the products. Now, how we intend to look at technology in terms of upscaling people? Because again, uh, upscaling uh, comes with a lot of expense you know, in terms of upscaling the sales guys, the mechanics, the electricians, and all of that. So, how are we going to use technology in terms of actually, you know, uh, optimizing these expenses in terms of upscaling? Because there's no uh, uh, second thought in terms of upscaling people, without which I don't think, we, as an industry, we can survive. Okay. So, so in general, we have talked about few aspects of. Uh, the cost structure of the dealership and primarily if I oversimplify, uh, uh, the cost can be bracketed into four buckets at the dealership, uh, which is rental, rentals they have to pay, or the cost of the land stroke rental, then you have the inventory cost or the interest cost, overall interest cost, manpower cost and the marketing cost. So here you're talking about let's say manpower and training kind of a cost, right? So if the thing is, again in our, in my personal opinion in MG India's, uh, philosophy. Uh, I think the rentals, uh, as we go forward, we need to minimize. Means you need to think of lower and lower infrastructures, especially in terms of sales outlets, workshop probably, still you need more. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the interest cost, as I said very clearly, we want to talk about retail so that you can minimize the inventory so you save there. On the manpower and training, we consider it's not a cost, it's an investment. Right? So there you need to spend a lot of time uh, and a lot of resources. And here again, what we are talking about, as an example, in our, in our case, you know, when we talk about dealers' meetings, you know, and I just want to give you a small practical example. So typically, you have dealer councils or, uh, you know, overall, all over Indian, in India, the national level dealer meetings, regional level meetings and all, uh, and, and that's expense. So we are saying here, if suppose we can create uh, a, a, a communication center in your head office and everybody has a screen and you can talk almost daily uh, or weekly. So here, like if I have to talk to dealer principal, we say, hey, everybody just join in on the WebEx and we just make fortnightly call or our head of sales is talking to respective uh, head of sales every, every week. So, so you cut on the communication cost and then we are talking about, and by the way, when, when we are saying communication, it's some part of this communication includes training. So every day, every second day, every week, you can keep giving some kind of modules to your guys through, through this kind of uh, uh, tools, what we are using. So we have a kind of a command or communication center in our head office, and through that you can talk to the guys and every dealer has got, it's very easy by the way, these days, right? Uh, free, free portals are there to communicate. Uh, so you don't have to physically meet sometime. Once in a while, it's obviously you need to meet one. So other thing is like through the WebEx kind of training program. So you have a lot of tools now. Obviously, you need to do your initial face-to-face -face meeting, product training, and things like that. But reinforcements, reinforcements, you can do it through, through, through the digital tools. And that's what we are trying to do it. Here, I would say, um, my, my favorite term is more is less. So I think more communication, more training, and this is what we need to do. And frankly, we are grappling with uh, lots of this kind of issues right now because we have just started the game, and as you said, we are new kids in the block. Uh, there's a lot of technology in our product, and, and lots of things everybody is learning still as I speak. You know, when when you say, when we give a connected car and internet car, and, and there's a Ghana application which you can which you can uh, which you can stream, but suppose you go from in a location from 4G to 2G or 3G, Ghana is not working, and customers say hey, it's a problem in, in the software. It's, there's no problem; it's a connectivity issue. But you have to train people, you know. So I think uh, uh, this is an investment. I think which we have to keep doing it, and, and that's the job of uh, job and responsibility of OEM, in my opinion. And we can share the cost, or initially probably we have OEM only has to. I think it's time to sum it up now. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, reflections, ideas which have come up, whether it is in terms of you know optimizing inventories, thereby reducing the inventory carrying cost. But uh, there seems to be a common agreement that yes, it is time to actually ensure that you know there is more money at the dealership to invest for the future and to see that the customers are satisfied and you know they come back and we are able to build the business. So with that, you know, uh, I thank all the. Uh, 
uh, panel members. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to the eminent uh, moderator and our eminent panelists. I request you to, after that photo opportunity, please stay back with us because uh, we have to ha get the felicitations in order. And we're really, really grateful to the entire panel for such a wonderful session. Uh, so I'm going to start by calling on stage Mr. Sharad Gupta, partner High Tech Motors, uh, to come and felicitate uh, Mr. Anuj Kathuria first, Chief Operating Officer Ashok Leyland. So I'm going to request Mr. Sharad Gupta there with us. Eminent panelists, may I request you to please stay back for just a second. Mr. Sharad Gupta, not there. I'm going to then uh, invite Mr. R.C. Rodri. There he is. No? Not there. Mr. Vignesh is going to do the felicitation. To Mr. Uh, Anuj Kathuria, Chief Operating Officer, Ashok Leyland. So I request you to please present one to Mr. Rajan Pentel, Senior Group President and Group Head, Branch and Retail Banking, Yes Bank. Mr. Rajat Mahajan, Partner Deloitte Consulting India. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a big hand for our speakers, please? Mr. Rajiv Chaba, President and MD, MG Motor India. Mr. Yadvinder Singh Guleria. Okay, there he is. Mr. Rama Rao, former EVP Sales Marketing and Aftermarkets HD Trucks BCV. Mr. Mr. All right, Mr. Rajiv Chaba. Mr. Harish Suri, FADA Chairperson, Uttarakhand. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Yadvinder Singh Guleria, SVP Sales and Marketing. Can we have a big round of applause once again, ladies and gentlemen, for the eminent moderators? Thank you, sir, for doing the honor.